Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, third webinar series organized with the Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network, which is an organization based in uh, Sydney, Australia. My name is uh, Jerome Babate, and I'm, I'll be your host and moderator for today's uh, webinar. I'm originally based in the Philippines, but in the last five years, I'm already here in Sydney, Australia, and I'm exciting, excited to be hosting this session today. Before we go further, I want to review the functionality of Zoom platform. We are using Zoom platform at the moment. So your active participation is important throughout the session. Right now, I have everyone on mute to avoid background noises that may distract you from listening to the webinar. Okay. okay. So nurse turnover has recently gained greater attention due to strong correlations with patient outcomes. Okay. Example, patient falls, infections, low staff morale, poor job satisfaction and quality patient care. Okay. So we're glad that uh, for the second time we are bringing in a good friend of ours. Okay. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Dr. John Robert Bautista. Dr. Bautista is a Bollard postdoctoral fellow at the School of Information, University of Texas in Austin. He completed his PhD in communication science at the, at the Wee Kim Wee School of Communication and Information, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Okay. His research examines ICT adoption, which includes smartphones, uh, social media and location-based advertising, including its predictors, outcomes, and processes in healthcare and non-healthcare contexts. As a Filipino nurse, he also conducts research that has po policy implications for nurses in the Philippines. He has articles published in top-tier journals such as Computers in Human Behavior, Cyber Psychology, Behavior and Social uh, Networking, Health Communication, International Journal of Medical Informatics, Journal of Health Communication, Journal of the American Medical Informatics Association and Nursing Outlook. Today, he will be talking about addressing nurse uh, turnover in an era of decre decreasing nursing workforce in the Philippines. Before I hand over the mic to Dr. Bautista, I have a few housekeeping uh, items to cover about this presentation and the webinar platform itself. First, today's webinar will be available after the live session and is accessible on YouTube. We will send you a link to the recording of this event so that you can share it with your social network, networks. And next, we'd like to hear from you during today's presentation. Our experts colleague at the moment will be joining us as a panel reactors to provide commentary and insights. Uh, Dr. Patria Manalaisai, Dean of the College of Nursing at Ateneo de Davao University. Uh, Hello. Mr. Elmer Organia, Dean of the School of Nursing, Notre Dame of Takorong College. Dr. Ana Perez, uh, nurse researcher from the Department of Health and uh, Department of Science Technology in Region 8. And uh, we will uh, acknowledge the other uh, reactors later. And at last, I would like to encourage you to share today's webinar with your social uh, networks. So without any further hesitation, I'd like to kick things by welcoming our Dr. Bautista over to you. Dr. Robert. Oh, thank you very much for the warm introduction. Um, you can call me Robert. Um, I'm, I just got my PhD this, uh, this May, so I'm not used to the word doctor. So, uh, Robert na lang po. So, um, I recently moved here in the University of Texas about a month ago. Um, so I'm not currently doing, um, full-time nursing research, but on the sidelines, I've been doing a couple of, um, nursing research and, um, fortunately, this research tend to have some policy implications that we can learn from. So one of the main things that I'll be talking about is, is how to address nurse turnover in an era of decreasing nursing workforce in the Philippines. Um, nurse turnover is usually used as a formal terminology for nurse resignation. The assumption is that once a nurse resigns, there will be another person who will be hard. So there's a turnover. So after one goes out, another goes in. But it's starting to be a challenge to replace nurses because there's a decreasing nursing workforce, not only in the Philippines, but globally. So here we're going to discuss some of the key ideas um, on how can we address nurse turnover, especially that there's a global um, nursing, uh, decreasing nursing workforce. So this is a pertinent topic considering that it's quite um, 
uh, especially that there are very few um, students taking up nursing, I think. So we'll be discussing them along the way. Um, okay, so to start with, um, I'll be sharing with you um, insights from two new recently published articles. So these were published this early 2019. Uh, the first is about published in Nursing Outlook, and the next one is published in the International Journal of Nursing Practice. So these articles were produced in collaboration with both the academe and the industry. So let's go over to the first um, insight that we have. So here's a map of the world. Um, you know that Philippines, um, if you look at the map, um, personally for me, I know people that are living in these places and they're currently working as nurses. Um, for you, there might be more than that, more places. Um, back then, nurses were mostly hired in the U.S. or in the Middle East, particularly in Saudi. But most recently, um, there have been efforts for nurses to go to Norway, Germany, especially Australia also, and even as close as Singapore. So um, nurses are going... Filipino nurses are going around the world. That is something that we can be proud of in one way, but it's one concern. Because um, instead of our nurses staying in the Philippines, they're mostly going outside after a particular period of time. So there seems to be some, um, some irony here. So we're here to discuss some of the some of the issues about increasing nursing workforce in the Philippines. So before we actually address um, turnover, we would need to discuss first the overall context of is, is there a decreasing nursing workforce in the Philippines? So currently right now, um, we have two main issues, at least for me, um, at least for me in terms of the research that I've done. Um, there are two main issues that we're currently facing. Um, if you look at social media, uh, especially like um, registered nurses in the Philippines, a Facebook group, which is the name of the Facebook group is registered nurse in the Philippines. Um, you'll be able to see two sentiments there. Um, there are some recruitment issues, and one is another is the retention issues. Um, for recruitment issues, uh, there's this low NLE takers and passers. It means that there are less people taking the NLE. And most likely, there will be much lower of those who actually pass them. Some perceptions of poor working conditions and perceptions of low salary. And when the nurse goes in to work as a nurse in a hospital or any healthcare facility, um, hospitals are having difficulty of actually retaining them. So means that letting them stay at work. So there's nothing we can do with increased global nurse demand. Um, this is a demand. Um, so it's quite difficult to actually intervene on that. But what we can do is to actually intervene on stressful working conditions and low salary. So um, first, I'd like to share with you some of the perspectives about uh, what's the situation with um, our NLE takers and passers and what can we do about it. Um, this very per uh, this, the insights gained here are particularly of importance for nursing educators here. So let's start off. Um, so I'm gonna be sharing with you results of um, this study that we published this uh, 2019. I, I worked with um, colleagues from the University of the Philippines, uh, CIDS. Um, they, asked, they asked me to write, um, they, they have the data for this paper, but they asked me to write because um, I'm the one with the nursing background. So, What's with this paper? Um, I can give, uh, I can share with, uh, if you look at this, if you try to do a Google search for this article, you can actually download it, um, the, the accepted copy in my research kit. So this, you can actually download this, not the full text, but the accepted version. So nonetheless, I want to share that. Um, what's the data that we have? Um, though, the data that they had was that they have NLE-related data for 2010 to 2016. And they requested it in October 2017. So um, it's not as recent as you think, but 
this the most recent in terms of literature. If you're going to look at literature, you'll only find data that's like 2008 to 2014. But this, the newest one, which has data like 2010 to 2016, getting data from PRC and shit is not easy. Um, lots of um, administrative uh, requests and sort. Um, I'm, I wasn't the one to actually request the data, but um, the UPD Lehman actually requested the data and PRC gave them NLE related data. So it means like uh, how many takers, how many passers. And Chet actually gave the characteristics of the, uh, of the HEI. HEI means the higher educational institution or basically the nursing schools. So they gave like, where is it? Um, is it uh, public, private? Is it, uh, when was it established? And the number of enrollees and faculty, not for the School of Nursing, but for the entire university, if that School of Nursing is part of a university system. So nonetheless, um, let me give you some overview of what's, what's happening now in terms of nursing education in the Philippines. Um, so you can see there's this table. Um, I want to point, you, point out that most of our nursing schools are in Luzon. Um, I separated Luzon from NCR. So even by, even if you remove NCR from Luzon, um, most of our nursing schools is in um, Luzon. And very few are those in Visayas. Um, nonetheless, most of our schools are what we categorize as small. It means that there, there are less than 2,000 university students in those, uh, in those areas. Uh, when I refer to size, um, it's the size of the entire university. They don't have the size for the, for the School of Nursing only. What they only have is that the size for the entire university, if that School of Nursing is part of a university system. So most of it are small schools. And a majority of our nursing school in the Philippines is driven by private institutions. So um, that's the uh, state that we have. Um, most of it are private. A few are state and very few are local institutions. And most of them were established in the 1970s. Um, nonetheless, there have been several, some schools that were established beyond 1970 and even as late as year 2000s. So just, that's just an overview of what's the characteristics of nursing schools in the Philippines. Um, what's interesting here is that um, we actually computed um, low and high performing nursing schools. Um, if you look at the data, you can actually see the names of those schools, but uh, for the, uh, in virtue of privacy and confidentiality, we didn't publish those. Um, we defined a low performing school as for the past seven years, from 2010-2016, their NLE average is less than 43.26. So it means like you take an average, um, anything below that average is low performing. Anything be, uh, within and beyond that average for the past seven years is what we consider a high performing. Um, that's what CHED actually does as a basis. So actually, they actually did that before. So they closed down some nursing schools back then that had um, below average um, NLE passing rates for the past, past five years. So we actually adopted that formally that they use. What's interesting is that um, nursing schools in Visayas, a majority of nursing schools in Visayas would be considered on high-performing schools. It's, it has a larger proportion than those in Manila. So it's a good job for universities in Visayas to actually have, despite very few nursing schools, they have a high proportion of those that I, what we call high performing. And there seems to be um, some issues in Mindanao that um, on the overall that most of the low performing schools, there are more low performing than high performing schools in Mindanao, which is somewhat a um, point of interest in terms of quality improvements. Next is that, um, you would actually see that um, most of the public institutions, it means the state and local, would have a high proportion of um, passers of uh, high, high performing schools. And on average, like those high performing schools, their passing rate is like 69.75%, which is actually great. Okay. Next is that those is um, uh, what you can actually see is that um, private institutions would have a large proportion of low performing schools. So that's the general uh, in terms of low and high performing schools. 
another pattern that um, um, that we actually notice is that um, first is that um, there are more takers in low performing schools than high performing schools. And in terms of passers, it's the opposite. There are more passers in high performing than low performing schools. So this is a point of interest that seems to be interesting. And nonetheless, in terms of student faculty ratio, um, we had data on the number of students and the number of faculty in that institution. Um, we couldn't say how accurate it is, but that's what that's the data that they actually gave us. So what we found is that um, the student faculty ratio between low and high um, performing schools is not statistically different. Uh, on average, like student faculty ratio is that one um, there are twenty four students for around, for just one faculty. So that's the average. It's like 24.7, 47, and 22.34 high. So it's not that much different. But uh, what's interesting when we actually do a bit more data analysis is that we found that um, the lower student faculty ratio, the higher that the percentage of passing rate. So it means that um, it's important to actually for nursing schools for them to actually increase. Uh, one strategy is that for them to increase their um, passing rate, NLE passing rate, it's actually to reduce their student-faculty ratio. So there are two ways. It's either you hire more faculty or you reduce the number of your students. So that's one of the insights that we have so that you can increase the number of um, passers, the percentage of passers. So this is independent of location, size, type, and year of its establishment. Unfortunately, the data that we have is only for 2016. Um, they didn't have data for students, number of students, and number of faculty for 2010, 2011, 2012, 13, 14, and 15. So uh, as much as we want to see a pattern, what we just saw is like for 2016, the lower the student, the faculty ratio, the higher the percentage of NLE passing rate for that institution. So that's how important is student-faculty ratio. Even there's not much significance in terms of t-test, in terms of plain comparison. So what's interesting also is that um, what I showed you was a more specific view of nursing schools. But um, what I want to really show in this presentation is that we have a decreasing trend of nurse takers and passers, even though there's an increase in the passing rate for the past few years. Um, the red line is the past passing rate. So there was a dip in 2013. So there was a dip in 2013, then it recovered for 2014, 15, 16. Although there seems to be a, um, um, there seems to be a going down trend for 2015 and 2016. But the most alarming here is that you would see that the number of takers and the passers is on the downtrend. What does that mean? It means that if you have a downtrend of passers, there are fewer number of nurses that actually go into actual nursing practice. So we have a decreasing nursing workforce here. This is one of the signs of a decreasing nursing workforce wherein you don't produce much registered nurses. So if you can see, um, for 2010, there's a big gap for takers and passers. So there's a big gap. Then suddenly the gap seems to be um, the gap seems to be decreasing. But the problem is that um, the trend is that there's a decreasing number of takers and passers. At the time of publication, we only have data for 2016. Since I have the data for those years, and I also collected data for 2017, 2018, here's a, here's how it looks like now. So if you factor in 2017 and 2018, we, can, we only produce less than 10,000 nurses per year. Um, the, 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 NLE, the uh, results of the NLE show that there are only less than 10,000 nurses who actually become, um, that actually pass the board exam per year since 2017. So if you look at the data for 2017 and 2018, um, it's just, it's already below 10,000. So that's quite 
alarming. It's quite ironic that they say that, oh, there are lots of nursing students in the Philippines. No, I would disagree with that. We now have very few nursing students right now in the Philippines as compared before. And what's alarming is that um, um, the passing rate, although seems to be increasing, but it's still within the 40%. So it's still within 40%. And let's have some um, thought experiment. Um, imagine this. If there are like 100 NLE takers, out of that 100 NLE takers, Six, uh, six of those will, uh, 60 of those will fail, right? 60% and only 40% will actually pass. Within that 40%, only 35% will, will actually register. Some wouldn't actually register or become inactive in years time. Within that registered, 15% will be actual practicing. The other 20% might not be practicing as a nurse they might be in other fields, although they're still registered. So it means that it's not because that they're registered, then you can assume that they're working out in the hospital, in the healthcare industry. No. Um, in the Philippines, we can register even you're not working in the hospital. So basing the number on registered nurses is a bit of n not that accurate in terms of whether you can say that, oh, we have a sufficient nursing workforce. No. Um, and what seems to be interesting here is within the practicing nurses, um, we can probably say like 10% are working locally and 5% might already be ab abroad. So it means that um, there might be one locally practicing registered nurse for every 10 NLE takers and probably 10 locally working for every 100 nurse takers. So. Imagine this, a uh, if you have a decreasing NLE takers and passers, um, that's one of the signs of an RN workforce crisis. So uh, we actually have a shortage. We are actually now in an era of decreasing nursing workforce. And I hope to actually validate this. If, if only PRC and CHED would actually give us more data. This data are not open access. We need... Uh, we need some um, high-level permission to actually get this data. So we hope to actually do more if they can actually provide more data. So it would be good to actually work with um, PRC and CHED to actually uh, do more um, intensive analysis. But this somewhat, um, the results that we have, the thought experiment, actually corroborates with the report produced by DOH way back 2017. Wherein, if you look at um, the target for human resources for health for nurses, if you look at it, um, we actually need 360,000 nurses in the Philippines. Unfortunately, we, um, the estimated, we can say that it might still be worse than this. We can only fill up about 25% of that target and we have a deficit of around 75% for nurses. This just nurses. It doesn't include physicians and midwives and other allied health, um, allied health uh, workers. So we can actually see that um, we have a nursing workforce and it's quite difficult to implement um, universal healthcare in this situation. So if hospitals are having problems hiring nurses, what more at the community level? So we are now actually in an era of decreasing nursing workforce based on this. So um, in summary, um, based on the research that we conducted, um, we are having a shortage of NLE passers and practicing and potentially practicing RNs. So what does it mean? It means that nursing schools would need to increase their uh, marketing efforts to actually attract those in senior high school to actually um, enroll in nursing schools. But the problem there is that would nursing schools have the sufficient faculty to actually reduce the student-faculty ratio? So that's a tricky game. Um, yes, you can get and get and get and get lots of nursing students, but uh, you also need to think about the quality. So it means like hiring faculty that would have uh, at least um, about to finish their master's at least. I mean, the law states that there should be 
master degree holders, but sometimes um, because of fac uh, faculty crunches, like very few faculty, sometimes uh, we need to hire faculty uh, to, so that we can have the sufficient faculty uh, number for our nursing students. But it's a very difficult thing to balance. So we can get more students, but we also need to think of like the faculty workload so that we can maintain the quality. Next is, um, so we know that we have recruitment issues. Hospitals are having a hard time to actually recruit nurses because there are very few of them now. And with considering the social political climate that nurses are much more aware of their political rights, that they want to have decent salary. They want to fight for what is actually in the law, salary, salary grade 15, then um, it's quite difficult to actually um, um, hire nurses. Now, the next question is once a nurse goes in, then hospitals actually need to face retention issues. And what are some of those retention issues? So you couldn't, you couldn't force nurses to stay there because there's an increased global nurse demand. There's nothing we can do about it. If our nurse wants to resign and it's legal for that person to actually resign, she or he doesn't have any bond to serve, there's nothing, there's nothing that the hospital can do. So there's nothing you can do about it. But um, what hospitals can do with is like, the stressful working condition. The low salary is not only for hospitals, but it's also some, it's an issue that would involve politics on the higher levels of our government. So which is quite difficult to actually for hospitals to um, intervene on a whole. But for stressful working conditions, um, that's something that we can actually mm, um, adjust, like make some modifications for them to actually stay in their um, in clinical practice so um, the question here that I'd like to point eventually is that would an increase in nurses salary prevent them from leaving um, I haven't published the result but um, we have some data on this and um, based on the data is that it seems uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't generalize this for most hospitals but the data we'd have from a particular hospital is that um, salary is not really a predictor. It's actually the working environment, which is how stressful the work environment is. So it doesn't really have a direct implication. So for personally for me, um, might not be a popular opinion, but even if we increase nurses' salary, they might still leave if the work condition is not really good. So... Um, Oh, I would also argue that even if we increase our salary to salary grade 15, which is about 30,000, other countries are offering way beyond that. So the problem now is that uh, would an increase in nurses' salary prevent them from leaving? I would say no, but I would also argue that at least there will be more nurses that would actually um, stay in the Philippines. We wouldn't prevent them from leaving, but I think that there will be more nurses that would actually choose to stay. So nonetheless, in terms of um, working environment, uh, I work with colleagues from the medical city. Uh, we just recently published this article um, this July 2019. So um, it's about specific stressors. So they had this um, clinical research project that I mentored them were in they want to um intervene with some of the problems that they're facing in the hospital and what one of the things that they actually want to look at is how stressful is the work environment okay so we want also to see whether um their perception of stress has something to do with their job satisfaction and perceived quality of care and turnover intention but uh, for the purposes of this talk i'll um I'll focus more on turnover intention. Um, in other words, intention to resign. Whether the nurses would actually intend to resign. Okay. Um, now, in terms of the study background, um, apologies. Um, so for the study background, um, it's an 800 bed level three hospital in Metro Manila. Um, we actually had a web survey of 427 staff nurses. It's like about 70% of the nurses. We couldn't collect 
everyone because some of them are on leave, some of them are on vacation, some of them are in sick leave. Um, so it's not possible to actually collect 100%, but um, if you get like around 70%, that's good for policy. And we actually asked them to answer a series of questionnaires. And one of the questionnaires included there is a 34-item nursing stress scale. So we asked them specific questions about stressors. And we actually asked them whether that occurred from never to very frequently. So if you if you are interested, you can actually look at the paper. But in general, um, the 34 items uh, nursing stress scale points to um, seven stressors. But based on the analysis that we did, uh, we actually found that instead of 34 items, only 31 items are applicable in the Philippines. And the number of factors is different from the original to the actual study. So that's a bit more technical, but nonetheless, um, what we found is that there are top three stressors. I'll be focusing more on the top three stressors, which is first, workload. I think if you had a survey in the whole Philippines, this will still be number one. This is just one hospital. That's the limitation. But I would argue that um, in the Philippines, this and even around the world, workload will still always be number one in terms of stressors for nurses. Um, specifically, what we found is that most nurses felt that um, the, the stressor is that most frequently is too many non-bedside nursing tasks, which is specifically about paperwork. So imagine the nurse needs to chart several nursing forms and they have so much nursing bedside care that they need to do. So they need to balance that. So sometimes um, um, that's, that's one of the reasons why some nurses might be actually doing overtime. So they're extending beyond their shift because they want to complete the paperwork. So the paperwork itself is a considered a non bedside nursing task that is a source of stress. Next is that um, I think for most hospitals in the Philippines right now, um, there's not enough staff to adequately cover the unit. Um, I've heard cases that some hospital actually close their units because there are not much nurses actually working there. So imagine if, you all, if the unit only has three nurses and those three nurses work as a morning, PM, and night shift. So there's no more opportunity to take an off because those three nurses need to rotate every day. So that, would, that is a worst case scenario. So there's not enough staff to adequately cover the unit. Next is that patient suffering. Um, first is that um, perf this is something that is outside the control of hospitals. Uh, nursing practice entails that we actually see suffering. And it is considered a stressor for nurses, at least in that particular hospital. Specifically, for forming procedures that patients experience as painful, next is that pa watching a patient suffer. So it means that um, at least this one indication that our nurses are still, I would say, um, human. We feel the suffering of others. And sometimes because of it, the frequent we see th th those things, the frequent that it might become a source of stress. So that's one area that um, they actually intervened, so which I'll be discussing later. Next is lack of support. Um, specifically, lack of an opportunity to talk openly with other unit staff about problems on the unit. Um, I've seen posts on social media about uh, workplace bullying. Um, so that's one of the key issues also. It's like lack of opportunity to express my negative feelings toward patients to my co-staff. So it's not only like about work, but about like their negative feelings towards patients um, to their co-staff. Um, in general, what, um, what we actually see is that this, uh, the frequency of stressors in general is not that high. It's just that these are the top three stressors. This is not something a cause for alarm but something that the hospital can actually improve on. So 
um, it's important to say that um, some hospitals might have a very low level of stressors. But within that low level, you can actually see who's the top one, who's the top two, three, four, and five, and six. So for this hospital, um, workload, patient suffering, and lack of support. And conducting research um, makes it worthwhile because they can actually do some evidence-based interventions. So now they need to focus on this top three stressors. Nonetheless, um, what are some, um, so we know the stressors now, but how are they related to turnover intention? So first is that we found age. Um, younger nurses, um, this is a bit understandable. Um, younger nurses would have higher intention to actually resign. Um, we don't have data if whether they actually resign or not. That involves longitudinal research that we hopefully do, we want to do in the future. But at least um, based on this data, um, younger nurses would have the higher intention to actually resign. Next is that, um, surprisingly, uh, nurses in specialty areas um, like ER, ICU, um, operating room would have higher intention to resign. It's not because of the hospital, I think. I think it's because their skills is very marketable abroad. So if you have a very highly specialized skill, the more that you think of resigning because of greater opportunities abroad. So that's the pattern that we actually saw. Um, it's quite rational. So if you're like you, that's you can be easily hired abroad as compared to a nurse who's working in um, in a medic uh, in a medical ward or in a surgical ward or in any ward. So if you're in the ER, ICU operating room, um, there are much higher chances of you getting hired abroad. So you have much more higher intention to resign. But if you control for those factors, um, what we saw is that the higher the workload, the higher the intention to resign. So the higher that they feel that the workload is heavy, they would actually um, more inclined to actually uh, they intend to resign. Next, um, surprisingly, um, it's almost as the same weight as with conflict with nurses. It means that the more that you make enemies out of your colleagues, then that's a source, uh, that's probably a reason for you to actually have a greater intention to resign. So it's about camaraderie. So there's some saying that if your uh, co-nurse, who is your within the shift, you actually get along with, you don't really feel bad during that shift. Even the patients make you a bit, even the patients make it difficult for you. But if you have a colleague that you have the same vibes, you actually want to work with them, you have a good relationship with them, then you can overcome those things. But even the environment is actually good with the patient, but you have, you have a coworker that you don't really have the same energy level or you don't really like them personally, then that can be a source of strain, a stress that would make you susceptible to actually conflict with nurses. So the, now, the bottom line here is like, what were the actions by the nursing department based on the results of this research? Um, so disclaimer, this is only one hospital, but um, this research was um, conducted because they want to actually know what they can do for their nurses. So we started with this kind of research. So for patients suffering lack of support and conflict of all nurses, they actually revised stress management program for current staff and new hires. They also actually revised this program for those that are doing clinical rotations, like for nursing students doing clinical rotations there. Um, the concept behind this is that now they can discuss what are the top stressors and you can actually preempt your new nurses, your current nurses, and even nursing students on what are some of the things that they might experience as something as stressful. The principle is that um, knowledge of stressful situations can actually mitigate the effect of that stressor. So you can, you can actually desensitize them. So you're presenting them the, the reality of actually working in this hospital that um, these are some of the stressors that you might face. Uh, we're doing our best to actually work on them, but um, we want you to be prepared with this situation. 
Next is that um, promotion of horizontal communication. Um, nursing, nursing as a profession is notoriously a vertical communication. It mostly uses a hierarchy-based communication wherein you're not allowed to actually talk directly with the chief nurse. If you have any problem, you need to go with your, support, your um, charge nurse and go to the ladder. Um, there's, some, there's some instances that um, that is effective, but I, we argue that um, if you actually do a horizontal communication, like for instance, um, the staff nurse can now actually visit the manager, supervisors, or chief nurse office without appointment. They can literally walk in there. So they can actually say, say their grievances on the spot. They don't need to actually book an appointment. They can actually go there and visit the office. Um, I'm not quite sure how many hospitals are doing it, but they actually, they're actually doing it right now. So that at least within the hospital, um, they would have horizontal communication. So um, yes, we still recognize, we still respect the position of um, our superiors. But in terms of communication, um, when I was there, uh, one of the things that we uh, think is that, what, what if we actually make, it, make horizontal communication much more formal? So you can actually make it less formal by saying, okay, you can do it, but if you release a memo that you can actually, that nurses have the power to actually do this, then they'll probably, that this might resolve some of the conflicts. Next is that, um, they're now doing regular intra and interprofessional socialization activities. So Nurses Day is like, I would say, an intraprofessional socialization activity that you improve camaraderie among nurses. But sometimes the conflict is not within nurses only, but also like nurses and physicians most of the time. So they're actually doing more interprofessional socialization activities, which also includes like the med tech, the pharmacist, the nutritionist, the dietitian, and different uh, other healthcare workers within that hospital. So uh, because of the research, we have much more somewhat, um, I wouldn't say concrete evidence, but evidence that would say that probably this is a good idea so that we can improve camaraderie and prevent conflict among nurses and beyond nurses. So next is for workload, um, reduction of paperwork. Um, they actually lobbied for faster deployment of electronic documentation systems. They actually have like uh, the computer on wheels and some of the forms are already um, uh, electronic, but they're, um, they're pushing for more um, electronic documentation system by utilizing Office 365 electronic forms. Uh, may not be applicable for some hospitals, but hospitals can actually apply for Office 365 um, um, subscription and for a discounted rate and some um, and using that platform you can actually make your documentation system some of them can be electronic so the IT office of that hospital can actually consult Microsoft for that next is that um, attracting new hires and improve retention of existing staff so why um, if you attract new hires and you make your current staff to be there, they won't resign, then you would achieve a good nursing staff mix. So the workload will be much more negotiable as compared that you're having problems with attracting new hires and more nurses that are resigning. So they restructured the salary and benefits system to be much more, um, I would say, um, appealing. They also sponsored educational advancement opportunities. For example, um, back then, um, staff nurses are not allowed to actually take masters. Now they actually support their um, staff nurses and especially the charge nurses, especially those in the more managerial level to actually take up masters. And they, um, they actually um, adjust your, the staffing based on whether you need to go for, for a class, usually on Saturday. And they also have partnership with another institution which offers like online classes for master of arts in nursing. So they're much, they're supporting the educational advancement of their nurses and as a construction of an in-house dormitory. 
So that's one way to actually attract new hires that even you're living in a far, far away place, you can actually work here because we actually provide an in-house dormitory. So now in summary, um, we have a decreasing nursing workforce in the Philippines and there's nothing we can do with increased global nurse demand. Um, that will be there for the time being. But what we can do is reduce the stressful working conditions and actually increase the number of takers and especially the number of passers or our NLE. So how do you address nurse turnover in an era of decreasing nursing workforce in the Philippines? Um, for me, for nursing schools, um, intensify student recruitment to enter nursing schools. It's one. Uh, um, it's a bit ironic, but there's still more people that think that there are lots of nurses in the Philippines, but I would argue that it's not. We have a shortage of nursing, especially uh, nurses, especially those that are actually practicing. Next is to reduce their student-faculty ratio, and I would suggest that to improve students' stress resilience. So when they actually enter the nursing workforce, um, they wouldn't be shocked with how the system works and how the practice is. So we can, using the results of our research, you can actually teach them that, okay, um, based on research, uh, workload is the number one stressor. So specifically, what would be the specific stressors? So for instance, uh, paperwork, which is predominant because most hospitals of the Philippines are not, um, we don't use electronic documentation systems. We still use paper-based documentation. So that's one stress, source of stress. For hospitals, um, some hospitals actually sponsor nursing students as scholars. So you can actually sponsor nursing students to become scholars and you give them like, um, for example, a contract like for the next two, three years after you've passed your board exam, you can actually go uh, work for the hospital for us and we can sponsor your masters eventually. Some nurses find, find that attractive. So um, hospitals can actually sponsor nursing students as scholars. Next is to improve salary and benefits to attract and retain new nurses. So hospitals now, I think, are fighting over um, newly registered nurses. It's quite the opposite in 2008 when I finished, when I passed my NLE, where it's quite difficult. You, all, you need to pay the hospital to become a volunteer. Now it's the opposite. Hospital fight over you so that you would, um, you would actually apply in their hospital. So you can actually see that in social media posts say, um, that hospitals are hiring, lots of benefits, perks. So nursing, those who pass the nursing board exam now have more choices to select. Next is to create a supportive and safe work environment. Um, even if you increase the salary, if the workplace is considered toxic, um, nurses would actually leave, especially based on the results of our research. Um, in terms of policymakers, um, well, we need to push for the salary grade 15 in public and also in private hospitals. And um, there should be strong enforcement of the nurse-patient ratios in public and private hospitals. These are very difficult things to do. But um, I believe that slowly, at least PNA is, and other uh, relevant nursing organizations are doing their best to actually make this happen. So we need to support them in such endeavors. So um, in conclusion, um, if we don't do something about it, um, our nurses would actually leave. And if you're actually familiar with this song, um, just a 30 second of the audio. So we hope that um, our country would be able to do something for our nurses because if we don't do something about um, else, then the message of this video would actually come true. So bakawala nang matira sa Pilipinas. So we need to do something about it. Okay. So I hope everyone learned. Um, something about it and first uh, before i end this talk um, i'd like to acknowledge the university of the philippines center for integrative development studies especially clarissa david and joffrey Dukans, and also 
the, the Medical City Nursing Services Division, uh, especially Mom Percy Loria and um, the VP for Nursing, Ron Abeleda, as well as for the Clinical and Translational Research Institute for funding the study in TMC. So thank you very much. All right, thank you for the wonderful presentation, Dr. Bautista. Okay, yep. did the study results surprise us, guys? Okay, let me unmute everyone. All right. Okay. Okay. Ah. Uh, yep. Perhaps we would like to entertain insights from our reactors. Uh, okay. But the, the mechanic is that uh, only insights coming from reactor would be at maximum of three minutes, and then we'll have a Q and A. Okay. So uh, we'll start with. Uh, Dean uh, Patria Manalaysay, Ateneo de Davao University. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good Welcome morning. to this forum. I am uh, from Davao City, and uh, I just would like to cite a few things regarding what has been presented by Dr. Bautista. And uh, I am not actually giving my own personal opinion, but I can base it on the study that I also have um, finished in year 2002 and also in uh, 2018, based on the Philippine nursing education and uh, other nursing-related issues. You have mentioned that uh, we cannot do anything, of course, about uh, retention, especially if the main reason for the turnover is because of job placement abroad. Yes, because we cannot offer them that much, especially if they continue to work with us. We know that we cannot do anything about it, so definitely we have to let them go. But uh, it's important that we understand now, of course, what is turnover. Because if that is really the problem, the reason behind uh, the leaving of our nurses, then we cannot do anything about it. But the rest, uh, which uh, were already mentioned, of course, we can do something about it. Let me just... Uh, uh, say something about uh, low performing schools, especially here in Mindanao. I'm not trying to <laughs> defend uh, Mindanao, but uh, the problem is it's nationwide. And since the mushrooming of schools in the early 2000s, we have so many schools that has opened and uh, we are not assured of the quality of nursing education that they are giving their students because, um, you know, if you can recall, many have relied so much on the review. And uh, actually, there has been studies uh, already done on, uh, on this because many schools have relied so much on the review centers, uh, especially to band aid whatever problem they have with regard to quality nursing education. So I should say that since I am from Ateneo and we have been performing well, I can only speak for myself, for our school, because I have observed that there is really a disparity in the results in the NLE here in the side of Mindanao, because many schools also are performing our school and another school here in Davao City actually has been, uh, you know, uh, producing um, what do you call these uh, students in the in the in their performances in the NLE, and that is one thing I can say. But you know, many of our schools here in Davao has been closed because many did not uh, consider them as part of the, the schools that uh, they should go to. And uh, with regard to the recruitment issue, the, I am surprised that this has become one issue with regard to the ratio of one faculty to 24 students that you, you also have mentioned. 
but 24 students is not uh, acceptable, especially if, if we follow the CHED memo, because the maximum number of students should be only 15 for the senior students, the BSN4 to one faculty. That I cannot understand. And also, the downtrend of passers in the 26, 2016, there is no guarantee that there will be more available workforce because many actually have left nursing because there is no available plantilla uh, in the hospitals. So they cannot find any job related to nursing, so they have to transfer and consider other options. And um, as I can recall, there was even a time when there were 93,000 takers at one NLE. Perhaps if we can, if we can consider 50% passing rate of that, that would be 46,000 nurses available. If I should cite also what has happened in the past, based on my study, from 1970 to 19 uh, to, to year 2002, there has only been about 500,000 nurses in the Philippines. But now it has tripled only for a period of 10 years. We have uh, maybe reached uh, 900,000 nurses now in the register or in the roster of PRC. So with regard to nurses um, being hired by other countries, because this is a 10-year cycle. It has been on record that we, the Philippines, the Philippine nursing education has always been um, affected by the supply and demand. You know, every time there is a demand abroad, there is a tendency for enrollment in the nursing schools in the Philippines to increase. But sometimes they, of course, sometimes uh, react and uh, they react late. And so when the demand is already decreasing, there are still students, uh, there is still an increase in student enrollment in the nursing schools. So that has been the cycle and uh, the, it has been recognized that we have a crisis. Actually, it started always, it starts always with nursing shortage, and then it has been dragged to nursing crisis. Just like in the States, they also have experienced the same, but right now it is already the Philippines who is right. experiencing this problem. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank uh, you very much, uh, Doctor. Uh, you have exceded the three minutes. Okay, allocation. I still have more. Maybe if you can give me yeah, more yes, time yes. later. Okay, yes, we will have the Q&A later. You will have a Q&A later. You. Th thank you very much, uh, Dean uh, Manalaysay. Uh, we'll have Dr. Uh, Perez. Hi, I'm here. Yep. Right here. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. Yes, yes. Uh -oh. yes. Okay. First, I would like to introduce myself. I am Dr. Ana Sumta Perez. I'm a nurse researcher and extensionist and under the professorship of uh, Professor Doc Buboy Dargantes. Um, I am a commissioned researcher of the DOH and DDOS here in the Philippines. I am very active in, in uh, uh, wellness and fitness. I'm actually a wellness coach. Are you still with me? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, right. yes. yes. So, uh, uh, yeah, I am doing a lot more of researches on renewable energy and water resource management uh, in relation to health aspects of this. So, I am actually, um, the, the Dr. Bautista, thank you for allowing us to join and also to Jerome. The thing there is, I'm, also, I'm really a product of the turnover of these nurses. Mm -hmm. I am very skilled. I have 29 years of experience in the nursing education and nursing field. Uh, but it came to, to me that uh, I, I, am, I am going to choose uh, the opportunities that beset me. So the opportunities that are with me now are on research. So I had a very good mentor in the university 
and I'm part of the loop in the German uh, researcher. So I took the opportunity to really work as a researcher. And part of this, but I can uh, actually feel that there is actually a, a shortage of nurses, even in the local hospitals and in the local um, nursing schools. I truly believe in the research. And um, there is a thing that uh, uh, the professor, uh, Professor Robert mentioned about improving students' stress resilience. I go for that. That's really good. At least our students are are knowledgeable of the things that a nurse is supposed to do. And then uh, I am also uh, uh, looking into the possibility of uh, of allowing the nurses, especially our older nurses, to really go pampering. It, it seems that they have been so, so tired of working as a nurse and their lifespan are quite shorter. It's because of the stress of the work and the low pay. So I, I guess I, I, I would uh, suggest that our administrators are more sensitive and sensible to let them feel um, the importance of the presence of the nurses. Um, another thing is I go for the, for that, that the nurses uh, can be supported with their master's degree and uh, they can study and they can also experience um, uh, relief in the economic side because it seems that some of the nurses are still uh, given less than 18,000 salary in the country and it is, it is so little to support a family and uh, I, I, I really go for the improvement of the nursing profession and also if I am given the chance to uh, uh, share also then uh, I also share opportunities for nurses. It's not only for, for their fitness, but I, because I'm also a wellness coach, but I go also for the economic side of this. And then at least the nurses don't go very sick anymore. They are vibrant and they are, they are moving and they are energetic and they have also income. But uh, in, in my work as a wellness coach, it's still, um, I can still help a lot of patients because many patients still come to us. Uh, these are patients who are really sick and diabetic and if we can always use the nursing principles to take good care of them. Only that I don't uh, anymore give them the medicines but I only suggest, I suggest for their food and their calorie count and I do all those things for them. Uh, that's what I really do. And, but uh, I, I am thankful for Jerome Yep. And the other panel reactors, I'm also thankful for um, Nurse Bautista for sharing all this information. Yes. Actually, um, it's, it's hard also when you lose uh, people by migration, by death, or by... Because when, when they leave the organization, they also bring with them their skills. So I suggest for a succession plan as early as now. And even if we teach the leadership and management in our respective nursing schools, we teach them also the succession plan. And we are more collaborative in our work, in our smiles, in our, in our, you know, in our intentions, good intentions for all our nurses. Only positive vibes, <laughs> Dr. Thank Jerome you very and much. Dr. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dr. Paris. You made your point. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to you in a, a short while. Okay. Uh, Dean, Dean Elmer Organia is... Uh, going to give us insight as well. Yeah, thank you, Sir Jerome. Yep. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you in this nursing webinar. Hi, Sir Jerome. Yep. Uh, Sir, Sir Bautista, thank you for sharing the findings in your research. So in this webinar, I will be sharing to you the status of nursing schools and the factors affecting the nurse licensure examination performance. I will also be partaking to you the job stressors for nurses and its implications to job satisfaction, quality of care, and turnover of nurses. This is in support of the findings of the study conducted by Dr. John Robert Bautista and his team. Yes, it's true that Filipino nurses are one of the best nurses in the world. And we cannot deny that their trainings in nursing schools and the actual nursing practice made them this way far. Dissecting the transformation of nursing education in the Philippines 
there was a mass production of nurses from different nursing schools that started in the year 2002 because of the increased demand of nurses abroad, especially in the U.S. With this, more nursing schools was established and most of them were producing low quality nurses. As a response, the CHED or the Commission on Higher Education issued warning to the nursing schools with poor performance in the NLP and moratorium on the opening of nursing schools was issued by PRC, BON, and CHED. This was followed by termination of nursing programs in the year 2013 due to consistently low performance of their graduates in the licensure. During this time, where there was a surplus of RNs in the country, nurses were abused by some hospitals and institutions. Because of the oversupply of nurses, both volunteerism, where a nurses paid to the hospitals with paid experience, low salary, around 10 to 15,000 a month for private hospitals, and poor working conditions and lack of necessary facilities, especially in public hospitals, continued to exist while most private hospitals continue to expand and prosper. This resulted in the decline of the image of nursing and nurses prefer to work in call centers and exploring other work that provide better pay and better working conditions. Nursing became an attractive that resulted in the drop of students pursuing this profession. Additionally, what worsens the situation was the implementation of the K-12 program of the Department of Education where additional two years in the curriculum was implemented. With this, it is expected that in the coming years, mm. supply of nurses will continue to decline where there will be few graduates of nurses until 2022 because of this K-12 program. On the findings of the study conducted by Dr. Robert Batista and his team on the quality of nursing schools in the Philippines, I would like to agree that most public higher education institutions had higher passing rates than private schools. This is due to sele selective admission programs of the public schools and they only admit in the nursing program those with higher admission scores. They select the best students. On the other hand, most of the private schools has no admission and retention policies. Some only aim for quantity, not quality, to increase their income. Additionally, schools in Visayas region has higher NLE passing rates. This may be due to more established nursing schools in this region that existed for a long time with established standards. Obviously, accredited schools are expected to perform far better because they were already evaluated on various aspects and attain quality beyond minimum standards. And another study conducted by Dr. Bautista and specific stressors using nursing stress scale I would like to confirm that workload and conflict with fellow nurses are the most common concerns related to turnover or intention of nurses to resign. The issue on one nurse, one ward, as practiced by some hospitals, especially public hospitals, discourage nurses to practice their profession. The quality of care is compromised, including the welfare of our nurses if the workload is heavy. Many nurses are complaining of increased workload due to additional non-nursing tasks and shortage of nurses in the hospitals. Some hospitals are implementing that 12-hour shift to maximize the distribution of nurses. With this, because of certain stressors and heavy workload, we have now burned out nurses, which sometimes lead to conflict, especially on scheduling, quality of work upon endorsement, and poor communication and teamwork. Recently, in our local, some hospitals are closing their wards because of staffing issues and shortage of nurses. Lastly, as a response to these challenges, individual nurses must support the efforts of nursing organizations in protecting their welfare. Nurses must also unite to gain political influence and hospitals must provide better pay and benefits and better working conditions so that they will be encouraged to practice their profession here in the Philippines. That's all for now. Thank you for inviting. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dean uh, or Elmer. Uh, that, that was a very good rejoinder. Anyway, yeah. Mm. Uh, I, I have noted three important things here, particularly on uh, yeah, a very controversial issue about salary increase. Uh, Dr. Bautista mentioned about salary not being a predictor of turnover intention, but supposed to be a, a very good positive 
practice environment. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll take note of this one. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, you mentioned about okay, possible actions that uh, both hospitals and schools probably would, would uh, initiate, like uh, revising the stress management program, which is actually a very good thing. Uh, in, in Australia, they call it like a mindfulness program. Okay, I, I think uh, Dr. Perez could, could uh, yes, relate to this. Okay. Okay, and then uh, second, Dr. Bautista also mentioned about hor horizontal program, uh, something that something that should open the minds of, of our uh, nursing leaders, nurse executives, because there's yeah, the, the vertical communication uh, environment at the moment is is not conducive. Okay, and then of course he mentioned about uh, reduction of paperwork, which is this one I think. Okay, uh, for the most part, really made make a lot of uh, this uh, issue board in some. Okay, anyway, let's let's go back to uh, the, the Q and A. Uh, Doctor uh, Dean Dean Patria uh, left a very interesting issue about yeah performance of the nursing schools in not only in Mindanao but overall in the country. She she did she did the research on that previously. Uh, maybe Dr. Patria would, would enlighten us on that one. Dr. Manalai Sai. Yes, uh, regarding the downward trend in uh, the take curves in the NLE, it's because, uh, as I have mentioned, it's because for some time, especially in the years uh, 2010 up to 2016, we can follow the trend that uh, there is few demand for nursing abroad, okay? So one is in the United States. Although many countries have been recruiting nurses from the Philippines, but the qualifications that they have stipulated in their recruitment requirement will not in any way jive with the current uh, available uh, supply of nurses that we have. So definitely only those who have experiences, those who are seasoned nurses are the ones uh, right away uh, given jobs abroad. But these are only quite, quite a few. Okay, so because of the demand, the supply of nurses naturally will decrease because, you know, people by word of mouth would know exactly. Like uh, two years ago when it, the demand uh, abroad started to increase, people by word of mouth would talk about uh, the importance of nursing as a career just to augment, especially with regard to the demand in, in, in other countries. So the effect is now, now that we have increased by more than 20% enrollment in the first and the second years, because we know the effect of the K-12 necessarily did not allow schools to uh, accept first year students. The last two years, we did not have uh, first year students. So it started last year based on my own personal experience. We already had four sections and that is quite an increase because we only had a few. We cannot even comply with uh, uh, 50 number of students to one class in the past for the last uh, five to eight years. Maybe we actually have experience uh, is, yeah, excuse me, Dean, Dean Patrick, yes. Dean Pat, is, is this uh, 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 a unique experience of Ateneo or is this true to every nursing school in the Philippines? Yes, I, I am. Um, this is my own personal uh, uh, experience. Okay. But actually, it's a nationwide, a nationwide issue. That's the reason why many faculty members and even the deeds were not available at that time when. I was looking for answers to some of the survey that I needed for my dissertation. 
because some of the deans were relieved of their job as deans because they did not have students. But now the trend actually is increasing because of the demand. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So I think that is quite thank, clear, thank, but okay. that is based on research. Okay. Thank you very much for that, Dina. Uh, Robert, would you like to have a rejoinder for that? Hello. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, one thing that I'm interested in is to actually get data from, um, from, um, what's that agency? Um, like some OF, OFW data. POEA. We can actually, uh, POEA, POEA yeah, yeah. Um, whether they would have data on the number of nurses leaving the country per year and to actually correlate that with the number of nursing school enrollment in the country. Um, the problem that we have is that first is like administrative concerns in getting those data. It's not easy. The, it's not easy to actually get data from those agencies. Next is that even if you have data, um, the experience that my colleagues in UP Diliman had is that they need to stitch the data with PRC and CHED. So what happens is that um, CHED only provided for the school, like the number of takers passers. Mm -hmm. And for CHED, it's a separate data set for the school and their uh, the type of the school. So they need to put the, the passing rate for each of the school manually because the data is not compiled, in, not into one system. So um, it's quite difficult to actually, um, um, as much as we want to actually um, um, mention something in terms of um, whether um, we're now having an increase in trend in terms of um, in, um, nursing school enrollment. That is something that we can actually say in general, but um, if we want data for that, uh, we need to urge uh, POEA, even DOLE. Um, so part of our, um, in the discussion section of our article, we actually mentioned about um, getting access for more data and for the government to actually um, much more accurate data in terms of like how many nurses are there and also about the student faculty ratio. The problem that we have there is that it is not the student only for nursing schools. The student faculty ratio that they gave was actually for the whole university. So imagine a university would have different colleges or schools and one of those is nursing school they didn't really have the data for that nursing school only. What they only have are the number of students in the entire university and the number of faculty members in that university. And it includes also other schools. So I hope that in the future, they can actually give us data that only includes um, data from nursing schools. Probably so, UDPCN can do this. Yeah, hopefully um, UDPCN needs to work with PRC and CHED on that. Um, even I think even ADPCN works on its own, but it needs um, high-level government support to have that kind of data. And I would also understand that some nursing schools might be privy of actually giving that kind of data. Um, although we can make it mandatory for quality control and for actually for policy purposes. Um, hopefully, um, in the future, I mean, my, I can help, I can help um, our nursing organizations on how to actually automate data collection, how to make it more electronic, to create a system wherein they can actually make that data easily, um, we, wherein schools can, or school administrators can easily input that data, be input in a server, and data from that server can be accessed by I would say uh, policymakers, researchers, and we can use that data for data analysis for further research in terms of policy. There you go. So I we think, hope yeah. that we can create that kind of system wherein there's an integrated system that um, that can be used for policy and also for nursing education, especially in the graduate level. I hope ADPCN will will support you in that because uh, Doctor, I I, I uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Doctor Doctor Patria is a, a board of directors of ADPCN here. Maybe she will lobby for that kind of project. Yeah, so I think in, yes, um, yes. in the future, uh, uh, ADPCN work, um, 
conferences, like one pertinent issue is like um, even a simple data on like on this on this school year, how many nursing students are enrolled, how many graduated, how many took the nursing license licensure exam, even uh, what's your accreditation level. Um, those kind of data we don't really have a stable. There is data, I think. But the problem is they're not integrated. Correct. Yeah, I, and, I think from based on the experience, yeah. uh, uh, Robert, oh. uh, based on the experience of Australia and even in New Zealand, they, they already have a centralized da database, so anyone could access it. Public policymakers, yeah, general public, of course, can, can access that one. Something that we don't have in the Philippines. I think I think with this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, Dean. Can Can I say something regarding that? I think uh, the ADPCN, with uh, the coordination of other nursing leaders in the different nursing fields or professional organizations, they already have started doing this. But you know, we can only do so much. It's uh, what you have mentioned, a higher level uh, government agency, which is, uh, I guess, the POEA. But you know, the problem is that nurses themselves do not register. They leave the country without uh, registering under POEA. They, most of them are directly hired by the hospitals in the different countries, and then they do not register as OFWs. That's the reason why we failed to have a very good data on these nurses leaving. Once they experience uh, problems or issues regarding employment, that's the only time they, they show up and air their, their issues and concerns. That's the problem. Yeah. So okay. I guess I agree that we should have uh, a database for this, but how I really do not know how to um, do it. Okay, thank you very think, much for that. Um, yeah. I think that database, um, if we get results from that, we would say that that is still the minimum because uh, under the assumption that most of the nurses don't actually register for that. I agree. But yeah, mo so hopefully in the future, um, um, I can work with nurse leaders into actually creating. We don't we don't need very high tech stuff for those. We just need a, like a architecture Frequency for yeah. data for data um, data integration architecture for yeah. doing that, and maybe, uh, we can yeah. work with some IT colleagues. Thanks, thanks, Ro thanks, Robert. Maybe maybe Dean Elmer will will initiate that in Region Twelve. Yes, yeah. uh, he's also very active in ADPC and Region 12. May I just add, sir, Jerome, that yes. the ADPC and president uh, in every regions are submitting uh, reports to the, the national office on the number of students enrolled per year, and maybe from there That's we right. can, uh, and then maybe from there we can just formalize things and uh, we can proceed with the database wherein all of us can access that that data. That's uh, right. yeah. Additionally, in support to the observation of Doc Pat Manalaysay, uh, in our case here, there is really an increased number of students. In our first year, we have three sections now. Uh, our second year, we, we have two sections, and we're having a hard time in looking for qualified instructors <laughs> because uh, the CHED uh, is requiring uh, a master's. master's degree for clinical instructors, and that's really a, a challenge for us. Uh, and hopefully in the near future, there will really increase of uh, uh, nurses maybe in the year 2022 or in the first graduates of the Kaito program will become registered nurses. Uh, yeah, I, I think that the real shortage right now is about, about the skilled nurses in the Philippines. Yeah, we, we yeah. lost so much, uh, you know, nurse educators, senior, super, uh, senior nurse, uh, clinical nurses, we lost that through you know, migration. So that, that I think is a big challenge there. Yes, sir. And I just add, sir, that the situation also has a positive impact uh, in terms of the salary of nurses in our locality. Mm -hmm. uh, private hospitals are pressured to pay high to offer more to our nurses because they only have few nurses. They increase the benefits of nurses and, and other perks just to encourage nurses to work in their hospitals. So I guess that's that's the positive side of decreased uh, workforce in the uh, nursing. Uh, but then uh, maybe we can take advantage this time that we have to do something 
uh, to to fight for our rights because we only have few nurses now. Uh, what if another cycle will come? And here comes after two years, nurses will increase in number. And here again, another abuses. Another, That's right. This, we are going uh, to another cycle, a similar cycle that we had a few years back. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm not okay. Th thanks, but thank you very much, Dean Elmer. Uh, I'm, I'm not private to uh, data about salaries in, in among uh, private hospital nurses. But do you, do you have any ballpark figure how much in in Region 12 and Region Region 11? Uh, the average, the average uh, for a private hospital. Private, uh, private hospital. Yes. Uh, Doctor Babate. Yeah, well, I I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, Dr. Dr. Uh, Dean Elmer and then I'll go get back to you, doc, uh, Dr. Oh, Perez, sure. Later. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, here in Region 12, the average salary of nurses in private hospitals is around 14000 per month. 14000 Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And then if usually nurses has overtime and they reach around 20000 per month, overtime because of shortage of nurses. Because they're offering 1500 pesos per shift uh, as an overtime, higher pay compared to the regular salary that they are receiving. Yeah, there's there much improvement lately. So okay, uh, what about in in uh, thank you thank you Bert. in in uh, region eleven? Region in, eleven, yeah. we have a running rate of about fourteen to sixteen thousand in the private hospitals. Oh, that's the take home pay usually is uh, only eight thousand. So sad to say. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting, huh? Okay, uh, I'll get back to you later, guys. Uh, Dr. Perez. Uh, hello. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, in, the, in Northern Samar, where my sister is uh, heading a hospital, they are paying at least 18000 This is well, the this tip is of private the hospital, huh? Private hospital. Private hospital. Uh, because they are also concerned because they, if they will not increase the salary of nurses, they will not also get nurses for their uh, private hospital. So they are up to 18,000 and they have free meals and they also can attend free trainings and free seminars. This is in uh, Katarvan District Hospital in the northern tip of northern Samar in eastern Visayas. Okay. Uh, yeah, related to salary again, but uh, what is the entry level salary for a uh, nurse educator uh, ci clinical instructor about 16000 16000 16, 16, in region 8 in in region, region in region 12? 8 okay thank you dr perez Can, in region 12 region 12 in paris but in our school 30000 30000 yes okay in entry school. level uh, entry level okay in in region 11 region 11 uh, i think I think it's around 18,000, but uh, other schools have given them more, all because they have also demanded from them more hours to render every week. So the, the 18,000 is a minimum of 18 hours a week mm. Mm. All right. service. Okay. 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 All the mm. rest are overtime. Okay. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So. Mm. Uh, Robert, Robert, would you like to say something about that related to the salary? Um, I think um, it will also always be a demand and supply. Currently, um, I've known some clinical ex instructors that they actually left starting 2012 because there were like a reduction in nursing students. Then suddenly for the past one or two years, there's a sudden increase in hiring even for nursing faculty. And I think the challenge there is to actually attract um, attract uh, more nurses that would actually convert from clinical to actually uh, in nursing education. I think the scenario here in, at least uh, from the people that I've talked to in the U.S., even here in the U.S., um, they, for nursing research intensive universities, um, they're hiring they couldn't hire more PhD students in nursing because they don't have sufficient faculty who will have PhD in nursing. So it's quite difficult because the, 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 what's happening is that um, nursing practice is much more, it, it's a much more paying work than doing research, which is much more stressful work. 
So they're much more of a higher salary for nurses who are doing clinical practice as compared to uh, those that are entering the academy. So the trend now is that they're, they're hiring nursing faculty that are not even nurses, as long as you can teach in a nursing school. So like, for example, um, social workers. There are some nursing, um, the PhD is in social work, but that person is teaching in a nursing school because they can actually teach some concepts that is being applied in nursing. Uh, nonetheless, um, I think it's a good start that schools are, um, are now hiring more nursing faculty. And I think the, I think the, uh, the balance there is to actually, um, is to, uh, the difficult part is to actually balance the student faculty ratio. I think the 15, um, just to clarify, um, the ideal for CHED is, is it CHED? 15, yeah. 15 is to one? No. Uh, can I, can I say Yes, something? yes, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead then. Uh, with regard to the current CNO that has been mandatorily implemented two years ago, last year, it started last year, from second year up to fourth year, we can already assign 10 students maximum to one faculty when in the past in the old curriculum CMO 14 uh, we only uh, we, we were we were allowed to handle uh, for one clinical instructor 15 students maximum for seniors for BSN 4 but uh, third year down to first year, it starts with eight, and then it is increased to 10 in third year. Mm, okay. uh, 15 maximum in BSN-4. But right now, from second year to fourth year, only 10 students to one faculty. But uh, that's a different situation for classroom, right? So the, the ratio yes, is more uh, about like group um, RLE groupings. For RLE groupings, yes, that, that would... Mm. Uh, actually uh, be implemented. That's the practice. And that is the requirement of CHEN. So if we go beyond eight for first year, then that has to be corrected. Yeah, I think the, the, the data that I present, unfortunately, um, is like, as mentioned earlier, is like, that's the number of students in the entire university. So the 24 is to one is a bit high. Um, yeah. But that involved, yeah, so um, and as much as we want, uh, we hope that we can actually get the data that is only for nursing schools so that we can have a good picture whether um, such, um, such ratio is being practiced yeah. in, in, in nursing schools. So because that's a very good insight that we have. Because Chad will really react to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Actually, uh, they have nothing, they have, I mean, at the end of the day, it's the data that they actually gave. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, it's data from them. I mean, uh, uh, we Hopefully can actually we can, give we can that bring in, back to them. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully we can bring in Chad uh, personalities next time in our webinar. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's Jerome. This issue. Yeah. Yeah. Jerome. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, Regarding the salaries, uh, the current salaries that our nurses have been receiving, at least the uh, majority of the private hospitals already have entertained the idea that uh, one of the biggest uh, concern our RNs have in Davao City is, uh, of course, compensation. So they okay. actually have been doing something about it, add to the basic, add to the benefits, and so on and so forth, just to encourage nurses to apply in their own hospital. All right. That is uh, what's happening here. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Jerome, Perez, I, yeah, I, Dr. Perez, I, yeah. I, I, uh, and as much as I would like to continue talking to you, uh, to all gentlemen here in the web, I, I am about to speak already. <laughs> okay, sorry for that, uh, Dr. Perez, but yeah. Okay. It's okay, but we, I will apply yeah, we for- We appreciate for, you for joining us. Yeah, I will ap yeah, apply yeah. for work with Elmer in Region 12. I am more qualified. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. you. No to Robert, thank more power, you. and to everybody, more thank power, you very much. more power. Good luck much on your love, talk. much love. Thank you. Thank take you. take care, Dr. Perez. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, we, we, talk, we mentioned about revising a stress management program as well. Uh, do you have some uh, in, in the uh, nursing education sector? Did you, 
are you doing any stress management program or uh, were you introducing a mindfulness program in your schools at the moment? Uh, actually, in the academe, since uh, the ADPCN has been very active in terms of addressing issues related to nursing education, not only them, but uh, the technical panel of the Commission on Higher Education, as well as some nursing leaders, have uh, actually recommended uh, some measures no, to address all this. Uh, and that has been going on, especially in the different hospitals. But you know, um, with regard to um, our recommendations on how to go about answering or addressing all these issues, we, uh, we have put in place stress management uh, strategies, but at the same time, uh, we have actually uh, mentioned that communication and, uh, if I may add, decision making with regard to our nursing leaders, because some uh, nursing staff would, would say that, uh, what about our nursing leaders when they make decisions? It's as if they agree to management that uh, they should be exposed to a lot of uh, you know changes changes in the organizational structure and uh, also workload they have been given more because they said we have to adapt to the situation there's nothing we can do to really do something about this mm -hmm. but leave everything to those who are currently employed that's the the main reason why they have continuing uh, concerns with regard to, to stress. But you know, anywhere you go in the world, there is stress. Correct, yeah. So yeah. the intensity is uh, different. But of course, uh, here in the Philippines, we can just cite all these uh, stressors, like uh, itong workload nila, no? But I, I, I guess the institutions can also do something about screening process maybe from the start to reduce uh, or to increase retention rate and reduce nursing turnover. I guess well, we can do something about recruitment in the first place. We have all, we have to have all the, the strategies in place to help ourselves and us employers and also the employees to give them a very satisfying working environment like Choose only those who are fit to work in your own culture in the hospital and also give it to the, the, the what do you call this, vacancies in the nursing positions will be given to those who have innate talents to do the job. So maybe you can do screening uh, on this uh, student so that you will not be left by uh, nursing staff who will not even say goodbye, they will just disappear after a two week uh, exposure to the real setting. That's right. Yeah. That's happening, mm -hmm. sad to say, that's happening. Mm -hmm. That's right. What about, yeah, thank you for, uh, Dean Elmer? So Jerome, in our school here, uh, we have team building activity to, to unload our clinical instructors uh, with the heavy workload. At the same time, we have summer outing and all other activities uh, outside the school to to lighten uh, what uh, what they feel and and to unwind. In the hospitals, uh, the main problem was uh, usually because of these queen bees. We have senior nurses that are being hired in the hospitals and been there for a long time, and most of them are not really accommodating well our new nurses. Uh, this is a transition for our new nurses and they need support from those senior nurses. But and luckily, as being relayed to me by my, my graduates, uh, there is a poor uh, preceptorship program in some of the hospitals wherein there is a difficulty in transitioning from being a student into an actual practicing nurse in the hospital. Mm, all right. Thank you very much for that, Dean Elmer, for shedding light on that issue. Uh, it looks like you've covered all of our uh, important questions, Dr. Bautista. Is there anything else you wanted to cover before we wrap up, Dr. Bautista? Um, so I think um, moving forward, um, eventually we need more data. 
um, um, policy makers sometimes um, we can relate all the stories that we can say but hopefully um, if our government can invest not only the government even um, our different nursing organizations can work together to actually for us to curate all relevant data for us to actually create more um, effective um, nursing policies that would have an impact to our nursing profession in the Philippines. And I would gladly help in creating such a system if that system will be established in the future. So the more data that we have, and not really more data, the more integrated data that we have, the more the, da the data that we have is centralized that people can access, you, me, graduate students, deans, um, nursing administrators can access to make relevant decisions, then it would be good. Yep. Great. I think that's, okay. uh, that's the lesson that um, I wish to partake. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bautista. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. At this juncture, I would like to thank Filipino Nursing Diaspora Network, Beta New Delta Nursing Society, Nursing for Humanity, Dr. Robert Jan Bautista, Dean Patria Manalaysay, uh, Dean you. Elmer Organia, Dr. Yeah. Ana Perez, and of course we miss uh, Dr. Or Dean Giselle Cotamora and Dr. Ronel Flores. They, they were able to uh, join us, but due to a uh, low, slow uh, internet connection, uh, we could not make it uh, full duration of the webinar. So thank you everyone and God bless.